Okay, we should be should be good on Facebook. All right. And what's going on, everyone? Uh, setting up the live stream here. So if you're watching already, which I doubt you are, <laughs> hang hang with us a second. We'll introduce uh, everything going on here. All right, we're good. We're good. All right. Uh, what's going on, everyone? I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle here in Bryan College Station. Across the room over there for me, but also next to me on this uh, lovely Zoom stream is the great Alex Miller, um, who is here to uh, twist and tweak and ask some questions. Robert Cessna, the legendary Robert, Robert Cessna, he's taking a much needed vacation. He is uh, out, I think, somewhere in on a, on a secluded beach somewhere in florida social distancing but taking in the ray the much needed sun rays that he uh he needs to get that tan so uh we got alex joining me today to talk through things but the most important guy in this zoom hangout is the guy that is either below us or beside us or i don't know that's tyler horka um and horka i said that pronounced that right yes sir all right why don't you tell the people uh, uh where you're from what you do and uh, how they can read your great work well, I'm from the great state of Texas, the Lone Star State, but I moved out to Starkville, Mississippi uh, just two years ago. I just had my two year anniversary with the Clarion Ledger, part of the USA Today Network, and I cover all things Mississippi State, football, baseball, both basketball teams. Um, so there's been a lot to cover, obviously, on this beat in the last couple of years, and including a couple coaching changes, trip to the College World Series, and uh, a whole lot of uh, good football stuff too. So it, it's been a good time. Now we, we've got to start. Well, first off, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook, on Periscope, if you have any questions, comments, want to get in on the conversation, go ahead and fire those things in on uh, the comments box. And we'll, and Alex will read those and get those uh, in the chat as soon as uh, we see them. But where we need to start is, so yeah, you mentioned Mississippi State gets a new head coach. Mike Leach is named the new head coach. He flies in to a, a throng of people. I believe that was kind of a weird, rough week for you, was it not? What was that experience like? Yeah, so I don't even think it was 48 hours earlier. It might have been 36 or something. I don't remember exactly, but I had an appendectomy uh, a couple days before Mike Leach flies in on that jet. So if, if you get the timeline in your head going, obviously an appendectomy kind of happens overnight. It literally happened overnight for me. I went to bed. One night, just kind of scouring Twitter, making some calls, saying who the heck's going to be Mississippi State's new football coach because they had just fired Joe Moorhead probably three, four days before that. And then I wake up the next day saying, uh, I think I'm going to admit myself to the hospital in the middle of this coaching change because I think I need my appendix taken out. And I was right. So they do the surgery. I wake up. The first thing I do when I, when I wake up from the surgery is grab my phone, right, and see, did they make a hire yet? No. But I did see that Leach was gaining steam. And um, did it happen later that day? I guess it – or maybe I, – I guess he flew in the uh, the same day that he was announced. So it all happened there in like 36 hours. Right. And like you said, it was a, a wild 36 hours at that. Yeah, yeah. And then you're out there, what you say, 48 hours at the airport when he's going and shaking everyone's hand at the fence, mm -hmm. live streaming – Yes. I'm sure with, with still like the stitches in or whatever, you know, what was going on? Like they like, actually used staples, which Ooh. apparently is not very common, but whatever they had to do to, you know, tie me back up, whatever. I'm thankful they did a good job, but it was not comfortable. Cause you know, it's right around the, the waistline. So right. I just threw on some, it was kind of chilly that day, but I threw on some athletic shorts. I threw on a, a hoodie and my sister actually flew out to Starkville to take care of me because you're pretty bedridden when you have that for a couple of days. Yeah. And I was like, Hey, can you drive me to this, you know, little small Starkville airport? Because this is one of the bigger days in uh, the program's history in the last, you know, may, maybe all time it's Mike Leach, right? Mike Leach yeah. became their yeah. head coach. So yeah, it was, uh, everyone there was shocked to see me from SIDs to fellow beat writers and even some fans. They were like, hey, didn't you just get your appendix taken out two days ago? And yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah I was watching your live stream and just the people come, there was probably as many comments of like, shouldn't you be like at home in bed yes. as to like, yay, we got a new coach. It was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to see. So again, Mike Leach, the pirate, he's in Starkville now. You grew up in Texas, so I assume you watched some Texas Tech football game Absolutely. back in the day when you were a kid. What is uh, what has it been like having him on campus so far? How much 
interaction have you had and, and what's kind of the vibe of the fan base getting a pretty legendary, uh, at least not if for not only his football, but for things he says, legendary football coach there in Starkville. For sure. That, that first press conference, which would have been the next day after the airport thing, I think, like I said, it all happened really quickly. Uh, you know, he did his uh, formal introduction and there were fans in the auditorium and it was more much like a cele- celebratory type feel. But then uh, we, the media got a little breakout session with him right after that. And like you said, I grew up watching this guy. Uh, I went to the University of Texas. So, you know, there's a lot of battles head to head going there. And I was just standing next to him, recorder right up in his face. And I was like, man, this is actually Mike Leach. You know, he's actually the head football coach at Mississippi State, which is pretty wild because, you know, the places he's been, Texas Tech, Washington State, uh, it's, it's kind of easier to run his air raid offensive system at places like that. Uh, I just feel like the athletes are a little more conducive to that style and, and the conferences in general kind of uh, are receptive to playing that way. So I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, SEC football, you think of these, you know, big burly defensive players and, and on offense, uh, it's gotten a little more to the point where places like Alabama, LSU, even Texas A&M have these, uh, you know, shiftier uh big 12 almost looking receivers, but I'm just really uh, interested to see what he can do with these athletes that he's recruiting out of Mississippi. Because if you look at their 2021 recruiting class right now, I think they have 11 guys and nine of them are from Mississippi. So he's recruiting the state really well. And um, it's just going to be interesting to see what, you know, the pirate, the, the mad scientist can do with these guys. Alex, what do you got? Uh, no questions yet. So, uh, um, definitely, definitely got to be an interesting time to uh, be covering Mississippi State, though, that's for sure. And uh, it's been ever since then, it's probably been a crazy summer there, too, huh, Tyler? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you talk about the uh, the stuff with the Confederate flag. Uh, I don't know if we want to get into that right now, but um, Kylan Hill just two days ago was uh, starting running back at Mississippi State, led the SEC in rushing last year, is coming back for his senior year. He was awarded the the key to the city of Columbus, which is about 30 minutes to the east of Starkville for uh, his efforts in getting Mississippi's state flag changed, which happened earlier this month. Uh, He basically sent out a tweet in late June and he said, "Uh, I'm not going to play football. I'm not going to represent this state until the state flag is changed. If you know anything about the state flag of Mississippi uh, in the upper left-hand corner, there was Confederate battle emblem. I think that flag was adopted well over a hundred years ago. So it's been around a long time and I, I, he was really candid in his comments. He said, you know, I've grown up here my whole life and my whole life I've had to look at that. And and that's not a symbol that I want to represent. That's not something that, you know, I want to stand up and put my hand over my heart and say, that's what, you know, we're pledging to. So his tweet kind of set into motion um, a bunch of, um, you know, people from Mississippi state and Ole Miss went down to the state Capitol building one day and, uh, they kind of lobbied. Mike Leach was there. Lane Kiffin was there. And they said, look, um, if you don't change this state flag, we're going to have a lot of athletes in our, in our state who feel slighted. So it's something that needs to happen. And lo and behold, I think it was a couple of days after that, uh, they announced that they are changing the state flag. So it's, it's pretty crazy to think about, uh, you know, what sports and sports figures can have an influence on, even when there's not a lot of sports going on right now. Uh, Kylan Hill did his part. He was awarded for that. And uh, I mean, that's, that's something that's going to be in history books right there. Yeah. And that's, that's a real, something I wanted to ask you about. And it's something that is happening across the country. A&M isn't necessarily um, um, any different from that. They have their Lord Sullivan Ross statue that they have players who are currently going out and protesting and talking about uh, Kellen Mond and infinite Tucker kind of leading the way on that. What has been the Mississippi state fan discussion reaction? Because here and I and I can understand it it's, it's maybe a little bit more cut and dry it could be I don't know with, yeah. with something like that and the confederate battle, battle emblem as opposed to a statue of a person who was a, a confederate uh, officer but what is the this fan reaction been like that have they been in support of Kylan Hill and the fan has there been some dissenters what what is the conversation around it been like Definitely some dissenters because you're going to have your people that say, Hey, we've had this flag for a hundred years and it was never a problem. I think those people need to kind of, you know, open their eyes and say, yeah, it has been been there for a hundred years, but this is still a change, whether it happened 50 years ago, whether it's happening today, that probably should have happened. 
So I think you're seeing probably 80 to 90% of people in support of Kylan Hill. If, if you go and look at any of his tweets or, you know, articles that the Clarion Ledger is posting, articles that 24-7 sports are posting, there are people that will say, congratulations, young man, you're very brave, you're, you're doing an awesome thing, this is the change that we need to see in society. But then, like I said, there's going to be some people a little stuck in their ways that say, why are we doing this now? And, you know, that's, that's the kind of discord that's always going to happen in America. But I've been, you know, as someone who uh, obviously as beat writers, we're not supposed to share our opinions too often. I, obviously, I think it's a change that probably needed to be made. And the fact that a sports figure was front and center in kind of making that happen. You've seen a lot of people in support of that. And it's, it's kind of encouraging in a way to know that um, they have his back, uh, not just when he's running for 150 yards against stout SEC defenses. Mm -hmm. Let's take a pause here and actually talk a little bit of sport because, you know, there, there isn't a whole lot to talk about now. But assuming that we have a, a season as normal, what is your outlook? What, what is, the, uh, the, what is the, the football team looking like this year? I know Kylan Hill is going to be the bell cow and kind of be the, 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 the guy, that, the, the, the franchise player of the, of the season this year. Um, what's the outlook on the team? Uh, assuming there's, again, a schedule as uh, 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 anticipated. And, and uh, what are fans there? What's the expectation level like? I don't think you can get too far into uh... – kind of a synopsis on Mississippi State football in 2020 without talking about the graduate transfer quarterback that came in from Stanford, KJ Costello. Uh, I think when I was, I did an SEC preview for USA Today uh, in June, and I was kind of looking at it. The only guy that has more career passing yards than KJ Costello in the SEC is Kellen Mond. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think that this guy's coming in a lot of people down here in the South might not know about him, but I think they're going to know about him pretty quickly. Like you say, if we're able to get on the field and, and play football this fall, really good quarterback. I'm a little uh, off and on, on the receivers he has to throw to. If you go back and, and look at Mississippi state's history in the past five years, really since Dak Prescott left uh, it's, it's not really a, um, a factory for wide receivers. You got to go up 90 minutes to the Northwest and uh, look at Oxford for that. Cause they just put a couple of uh, receivers in the NFL in the past couple of years, but at Mississippi state, it's uh, okay. We have, they, they have a good quarterback now, but it's, do they have the receivers that KJ Costello can throw to? Not quite sure. Uh, like you said, I think that's where Kylan Hill factors in last year. He had 18 catches. Look for him to have probably double that probably three times as many receiving yards as he has last year. I think he only had, uh, I don't even think he eclipsed 200. So, Kylan Hill uh, obviously is, is a guy that can go for 25, 30 carries a game, but I think he's also a guy that can get you five to 10 catches a game if you need him. And I think you're going to see a lot of that this year. Defensively, uh, I mean, Mississippi State is a factory for a defensive lineman, right? But those guys last year that, that were on the D-line were really young. They were mo mainly redshirt freshmen. So you're going to look for those guys to take a step forward. In the secondary – they got a lot of really good athletes, but again, they were young. They were at, at one point they were starting two true freshmen at the corner position. So I think it's going to be a better team than you saw last year, but I'm not sure um, in, in a 12 game schedule, which is already not happening. I don't know if you guys saw the news, but Mississippi state lost an opponent because the SWAC said they're not playing football this, mm -hmm. this fall. So they're not playing Alabama and M, but uh, if it was a 12 game schedule, uh, sniffing that 10 win mark would be really good. I think eight to nine in Leach's first year. I think people would be really happy with that, but I would probably put that over under somewhere around eight if they were playing a 12 game schedule. Yeah. With when you, when you mentioned how crazy this summer has been, first off, when you talk about an air going from like a traditional sec offense to an air raid. Yeah. yeah. There's a focus on the quarterback. There's focus on the wide receivers. Cause those are uh, very important parts. But when you look at the kind of offensive line and what they're asked to do in an SEC style offense right. as compared to air raid or what you see more in the big 12. I mean, big 12, when you get into the Baylors and the TCUs and the Texas techs, a lot of those offensive linemen are standing up or, or two point stances half the game. What do you know about the, or see from the offensive line that says that they can maybe make that adjustment quickly, especially in a summer when they're not going to have spring ball. They're not going to have that summer. They're not going to maybe gonna have a, a shortened fall camp. Um, 
for, for especially that offensive line, but then the whole team too, adjusting to a new system. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you've been looking at these workouts that they've been doing since the beginning of June, and you see a lot of their training uh, working on bursts. So they'll have bands wrapped around, even the offensive linemen, bands wrapped around. It's not so much strength training as it is quickness, agility. And that's what you're looking for from your offensive linemen in this system. And I, I wish I could answer your question. I am intrigued as anybody to see what these huge offensive linemen who last year were basically told, hey, we're going to give Kylan Hill the ball. You just got to block up field, lock up your guy. And if you see Kylan Hill running past you, you've done a good job. Now it's KJ is going to get the ball and you know, the air raid system. It's a lot of quick routes, a lot of outs, a lot of ins. And I think these guys are going to be a little confused at the beginning, but like I said, at the beginning of, of this answer, as long as they have the agility down, as long as they know what their assignment is, I, I think that these guys are smart enough. They've been playing football their whole lives to kind of adjust to that. But I mean, it's, it's probably the, it's been the worst off season possible for these guys to go from, like you said, a traditional SEC offense to what they're going to be doing now because they didn't have spring ball and it's looking like the fall is going to be just as, as wacky as well. So if they do get out on the field in September or in October, uh, that's where my, that's where my eyes are going to be looking. The, what, what are these offensive linemen doing? Because it starts up front in, in any offense, right? Sure. Sure. Well, what uh, return to play um, COVID testing, getting players back on voluntary workouts. What has that process been like for Mississippi state? How forthcoming have they been about the testing, the positive test is uh, test among all athletes and, um, what, what is the optimism like that, um, at least from an on-campus standpoint, that this is going to be a successful uh, experiment? Officially, they only came out and told us who, was, who tested positive in that first go. So that was, what, over a month ago, a month and a half ago now. And I think of the close to 100 tests that they did, there were five or six positives. And, and they saw that as a good sign. Uh, since then, they have not released any official information, but kind of in secondhand chats with, with some of the people uh, who are really close to the situation, the, the numbers have been pretty good. Uh, if, if a guy has tested positive, I've been told it's, it's usually not because they got it working out the, the way the timelines have worked. It's been a guy will test positive and then they do some contract tracing and they're like, oh, where did you go last weekend when we weren't working out? And they say, oh, I went back home. So, and, and that's the, that's the crazy part about this return to play thing is, you know, these guys aren't professional athletes in the sense that they don't have a bubble like the NBA. They don't have a player's union that, that says, all right, if you're going to test us this many times, we want this, or if this is what we have to do, then can we make this happen as well? These are just college athletes. All they were told is, Hey, come back to campus. We're going to work out. Uh, it's voluntary, but you, you have to do this test. And you have to, you know, stay in your dorm room or whatever. So, I mean, that's kind of hard to tell an 18 to 20 year old kid. So when you're looking at the broad scope of college football, that that's where I'm looking at it and saying, I don't know how this makes any sense because how can you tell, and in your guy's case, you know, I don't know what Texas A&M has said. I haven't read up, but how can you tell 60,000 kids? Yeah. It's probably not safe to be on campus right now. And we're going to start online, but tell your, you know, hundred football players, yeah, come on. We'll, we'll do some tests. If someone tests positive, we'll, we'll figure it out. It, it's just, I don't know what your guys' thoughts on that are, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, as of now, the AM Provost, it's going to be 50% online, 50% online classes from the get go. So they want to have at least some level of um, yeah. students on campus from the start. And then, the, of course, the kind of Thanksgiving cutoff. There, there's even been uh, stuff issued by the Corps of Cadets, which I know you're aware of here, that mm -hmm. uh, if they get, can choose to go on leave for a, for a year, if they want to stay home, but they lose their, their Corps of Cadets scholarships. So that's kind of a whole nother yeah. layer on top of all this outside of athletics. A&M hasn't really been forthcoming at all on their uh, numbers. Um, we, we don't know how many positive tests. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I haven't seen too many. They, they've just they've decided to kind of stay behind the, the the HIPAA laws there. So yeah, it, it is a fascinating take. And I've been around talking to people, talking to people associated with the program and parents and and whatnot. And I mean, the overwhelming thought is they're following the um, 
idea that if they weren't on campus right now, they would be going to their local Planet Fitness, Gold's Gym, you know, LA Fitness. And yeah. that is a more unsafe environment than the kind of somewhat bubble that they would be able to create in the athletic centers here, which you can argue the merits of that back and forth. Um, but that's kind of what everyone has been regurgitating around these parts, at least as of now, is that there's no safer place than these players can be right here because we do have the resources and funds and the thought processes to make it a safe place, um, which I'm sure is probably very similar to what you're hearing out in Starkville and what they're doing in Starkville to, to, to make it a safe place for these guys. Yeah. And Greg Sankey just said the other thing, the other uh, couple nights ago on that HBO thing that he did. And um, it was kind of the first time uh, that I had heard that. And I guess you've heard it from a few parents and players and whatnot, but it, it makes total sense to me because um, you know, the gym here in Starkville is not closed. The one that I go to and it's only required to wear a face mask upon entering. And once you enter, you can take it off. So I leave my mask on the whole time because I don't know. I just feel like I'm being a better citizen in that way. Maybe, maybe I'm doing something to, to help slow the spread of this thing, but you look around and nobody's wearing a mask and you can't force somebody to go get the, uh, the sanitizer and clean off the equipment that they just used. Right. So over the course of an entire day, you know, who's really doing that and nobody's wearing masks. So they're breathing all over this equipment. And I'm just thinking if, if we had college football players around the country working out at home, doing that, as opposed to getting uh, the thermometer stuck up to their forehead and getting the, the COVID swab pretty much every time before they go work out with, with people who are all negative. Uh, I, I think the, the return to voluntary workouts was, was good, but at the end of the day, like I said, um, you're only working out at the facility for a couple hours every day. What you do once you leave there is up to a college kid and a college kid is going to want to go to a restaurant if it's open, uh, you know, God forbid a bar, if those are open. And I think you're going to start seeing some of that leak back in to, to the, uh, the workouts and the facilities. And at that point, college football has a pretty big problem on, problem on its hands. For sure. For sure. Just a few more questions here. Cause I know we got to get you, uh, get you going out there. Um, for the, for when there's not a pandemic and you got to get a and fans want to get out there and visit Starkville. You said you've been there for two years now. What's, what's the, uh, what's the joy of Starkville? What's the things to see? What's the things to do? What have, uh, what, what makes Starkville a great place to live or a great place to visit on game day? Definitely the cotton district. Uh, my parents were actually recently visiting out here. And so the cotton district is this little setup of, um, almost old timey, uh, plantation looking homes honestly but they turned them all into bars restaurants um we were just at two brothers the other day that's my favorite restaurant in starkville uh the best smoked meats in town i get the smoked wings you can either have them with ranch or barbecue sauce my stepdad was like i didn't i don't need anything i can eat these without any sauce he said there's some of the best wings that he's had i probably agree with them but that's one of the bars that's uh down there as well so it, it doubles as a a restaurant that I'd honestly eat at every weekend. If someone came into town, I say, let's go to two brothers, but turns into a pretty good nightlife scene. It's kind of like a double decker um, with balconies and whatnot. There's really only five to six bars down there, but in, in a college town this small, that's, that's really all you need. So uh, it's a short walk from Davis Wade stadium. If any A&M fans do decide to make the trip, I, I guess that would be this year, right? Uh, no fans probably, or who knows what that number is. I don't know. Mississippi State has not announced anyway, but um, it's a short walk from the stadium. So uh, either celebrate your your win or uh, drown your loss. And, and it's a pretty good time. The Cotton yeah. District. Don't forget it. Yeah. Yeah. When that, I actually just forgot about that question. What do you feel like football looks like um, for, for Mississippi State, but just in general, as far as fans, as far as safety precautions, as far as how many games scheduling and games, what's kind of your take on, on what football is going to look like this fall? Conversations that I've had with athletic director John Cohen have been until they're told they can't, they are going to try to do the most that they can. And that includes games. That includes attendance. So, you know, if, if Greg Sankey comes out and says um, 50% and obviously a lot of this um, falls back on, uh, you know, local governments too. So in, in A&M's case, I think Abbott has said, 50% is, uh, is acceptable, right? So then it goes to A&M to, to say, all right, we will do 50%. I know 
UT just said the other day, if, if 50% is the number, we're going to do 50%. Here, um, I think Cohen said the other day, uh, it'll be up to, you know, Starkville's city government and saying, you know, how big of a gathering do we want to allow? But, you know, I, I heard the other day on a talk show, you know, how feasible is it to spread people out if it's 25% in a 60,000 person stadium? If as long as you can control the entry points and you can control where they're sitting in the stadium, I mean, that might be safer than, than going to like a crowded grocery store or uh, a restaurant or something. Right. So uh, long story short, they're going to try to have fans in the stadium as many as they can. And then obviously they want to play as many games as they can too. As it stands right now, that's only 11. Cause like I mentioned earlier, they've already lost the game. And I think I saw the other day that, New Mexico's governor is pushing for them to have uh, a delayed start and Mississippi state's season is supposed to start Labor Day weekend with uh, New Mexico coming in here. So um, I would be a little more optimistic just to have some fans in the stadium than I would be at a full season because it looks like that's already shot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you can look a little bit too at the, uh, what they were able to do at Bristol motor speedway um, spreading the fans out uh, yeah. there. And it'll be curious to see what, contact tracing and, and what came out of that because it was a decent example I'm with you I, I I'm, I've always said is and on all of these that if there's going to be fans let's let's let that be like week two or three let's let's just mm-hmm. get the football back on the field and kind of work up to it and see where we can get do I think that's going to happen no because the revenue talks money talks and they're, they're yeah. going to want these people in here um, they're going to want their donors to be happy to be able to watch football so I think that's what we'll see I would be remiss not to end this conversation, as I noticed the the furling of the little bit of a burnt orange flag above your head here. Is, is it burnt orange? Do I need to cover that up? Yeah, yeah. I, I know Tom. I know your boy Tom Herman today over at the Houston Touchdown Club was talking about uh, Aggies. And listen, this can be between you and Alex. This is y'all. I haven't flag. even heard what he I'm, said yet. I'm, I'm wearing purple, but he's talking about how they need to play the game, how the game okay. needs to be played, how. Uh, how you know it's good for college football all this stuff you know the all that what's your take on the game and do you have I mean, you grew up uh, a texas fan i assume you went to Absolutely. texas mm-hmm. so what, what are some of those texas texas a&m memories that you have uh looking back on, on that I'll, I'll just wear my purple shirt and be over here you and alex can, <laughs> can battle this well, alex <laughs> alex i'll say this i know you guys really want to play the game because Everybody knows what happened the last time that they uh, got together at Kyle Field. I think it was 2011. Justin Tucker, that's all I say. So uh, I was there. Were you, were you there? Okay. I was not there. I, <laughs> you I were never, probably watching, though. Oh, heck yeah, I was watching. Um, I know you guys want to play for more reasons than that, though, and, and so do I. Because, I mean, it's growing up with that rivalry in my life, it was honestly one of the best, uh, you know, it, it being Thanksgiving weekend every time and, just um, I don't even know if I want to call it pure hatred between the two fan bases, because I think there is some level of respect. I know I had a lot of Aggie friends growing up, so you can't hate them too much. And it's just a fun football rivalry. And, and that's uh, the cool thing about moving out here to Mississippi is, I mean, this is SEC country and I know College Station is SEC country now, too. But these people did not grow up, you know, needing that game having a rooting interest in that game or maybe even watching it. But when they hear me say, yeah, I went to the university of Texas, they're like, Oh, what do you, what do you feel about? How do you feel about Aggies? Uh, how do you feel about that game not being played anymore? So on a national uh, level, the, Texas versus Texas A&M is, is something that's talked about. And it's obviously a game that needs to be played. I, I'm ready to kick that thing off. I don't know about you, Alex. Yeah. I think it's definitely a matter of not if, but when, yeah. Um, I definitely think it'll be interesting to see the ramifications that come with everything that comes post COVID-19 if college sports are able to recover, especially in the Olympic sports. I mean, you think about the regionalization of sports. Um, I saw Kendall Rogers tweet today that it would be a no brainer for a and in Texas to play a three game series in baseball next year. Yeah. I mean, they already play that one midweek game. It sounds like Coach Childress and Coach Pierce really enjoy that. I've been to several of those games. They're they're really great atmospheres. But 
Yeah, it, it and going back to the old format of maybe like two in Austin and one in College Station, and then the next year, two in College Station, one in Austin, or, you know, maybe playing one game at, at the Dell Diamond in Round Rock or up in Frisco or down sure. in Houston. I mean, it it definitely is a is is a rivalry that is a statewide rivalry and you know it still exists today even though they haven't played each other in football for almost an entire decade but i mean it, you know also if we see like a mississippi state or even a&m being able to replace a non-conference opponent in less than a month you know who's to say you can't do that instead of trying to schedule opponents out 15 years down the road when the players who are going to be playing in that game are still in elementary school so Mm -hmm. you know at some point the game is going to return I'm still in the boat of it's going to come back in a marquee bowl game first um maybe in in a sugar bowl in a cotton bowl obviously there's been chances for them to play in bowl games but the SEC and A&M have probably said no we don't want we don't want to play down in Houston in the Texas Bowl like well let's save this for the right moment um so I think it's a matter of not if, but when. So I just, it's going it's to happen. I, I just hope we're not um, on the back nine of our careers at that point, because <laughs> like you said, scheduling takes a little while and I hope it comes sooner than later. Well, Hey, that, that, that might be all right. Cause somebody's going to have to tell those people what it was like <laughs> when a and Texas right. played each other. So right. I just want to be on the back nine period right now. Hey, real quick, Tyler, I, I, uh, to, to finish this off too, and you, you, I know when you, you're being from Texas, you know, that Texas fan, a and fans, when they're at the game and they're looking at this around the, the, the league, around the nation's scoreboard, it's the Texas's, it's the Texas techs, it's the Baylor's. They want to see the scores and that's where they boo and cheer. And mm-hmm. even at Kyle field now they run the big 12 scores and that's when everyone is, is booing and what A&M. They, they just me. can't wait to see Texas losing to Maryland. Right. 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 When you, now that you've moved out further into SEC country, how ingrained now has a And M become to the fans out there? As as they're one of us now, they're part of it, or is it? Does it still seem like th- there's a divide there? Because I know there's a lot of talk about well, A and M needs to play Texas because that's their real their only real rival. You can argue that something's brewing with LSU, but they they don't really have those SEC rivalries yet. Yeah. What is the Mississippi State's fan take? on Texas A&M and how ingrained they are into the SEC culture now. I I think that game matters to Mississippi State fans, honestly, from what I've seen. Uh, First of all, they wear the same color or at least the same shade, you know, a a close shade of maroon. So it's kind of connection. Yeah. And the Adidas connection as well. So I, and I think, you know, some of those games have been good. I know the one last year A&M kind of piled it on there and put up a lot of points, but the one before that kind of came down to the wire in 2018, which is the first time I met Alex, by the way, Uh, he he made that drive up to Starkville. So uh, vividly remember that. Um, Yeah. It's a game that matters to Mississippi state because they know um, let's face it, Mississippi state and and maybe A&M is just a step up from that, but they're kind of middle tier teams in that sec West right now. So they know, that's a, that's a gettable game. And, you know, any game that's gettable in the SEC West, you, you really want to win that one. And like I said, there's that maroon connection. Um, yeah, I, th- I think the Aggies are um, definitely kind of like a bona fide SEC team to the people out here in Mississippi now. Um, I know when Jimbo Fisher was hired, it, it mattered to Mississippi State fans because they want to know, okay, is this going to take A&M? to the top of that SEC West is, is this going to become a game that we can't win anymore? And um, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the Texas A&M game is one on the schedule that uh, definitely isn't overlooked. It definitely isn't one that people um, don't get excited by because they definitely do. Sure. Sure. Hey, let's get you out of here. I know you, uh, you're a busy man. You got to go get uh, get, get around that thriving metropolis of Starkville, <laughs> Mississippi. Um, thanks again for uh, joining us again. Uh, sh- Shout out to how people can uh, find your work and find you on Twitter and, and all across the platforms. Yeah, on Twitter, I'm TB Horka, H O R K A. And uh, follow the Clarion Ledger as well, because, uh, you know, if, if you're an SEC fan, like we were just talking about, you probably care about, uh, you know, every team in it. And my coworker, Nick Suss, does a great job covering uh, Ole Miss. If you guys want to have him on at some time, he'll talk your head off and uh, he, he's a really intelligent dude in a fun conversation. So yeah, Tyler Horka on Twitter at TB Horka and then uh, check the Clarion Ledger out too. Cause uh, we do our best to, 
to cover all things SEC sports in the Magnolia State. There you go. All right, Tyler. Hey, man, thanks. Stay, stay well, stay safe, and hopefully we'll be talking to you again here when football season gets kicked off. Yeah, appreciate you guys for having me on here.